Okay, in this section, we are going to see our last category of very helpful trigonometric identities. And these are the half angle identities. And we're gonna see that in a sense, these come directly from the double angle identities. So let's recall a couple of the double angle identities that we've seen. All right, so what we're going to do is to uncover these half angle identities is we're gonna take each of these two double angle identities in turn and isolate either sine or cosine of A, which will give us a particular form of that identity in terms of cosine of 2A. And then we're just going to cut the angle A in half on both sides and voila, we will have our half angle identities. So yeah, let's see how this works. All right, well, if we add two sine squared a to both sides of this identity, we're going to get two sine squared a plus cosine of two a is equal to one. And now let's subtract cosine of two a from both sides. So we get two sine squared of a is one minus cosine of two a and now let's divide everything by two in order to have sine squared by itself. So we're gonna have one half of one minus cosine of two a. Okay, so in order to create the half angle identities, what we're now going to do is replace each a with a over two. So on the left, we'll have sine squared of a over two and on the right, we're gonna have one half, one minus cosine of, well, two times a over two is just gonna be a. And there we are, this is a half angle identity. Now, this isn't the form we typically write it in, so let's take the square root because this is the form we normally see this in. And note that this entire fraction is within the square root, including the denominator two. So this is the half angle identity for sine. Okay, we're going to do the same thing to find a half angle identity for cosine. All right, since we'd like to have cosine isolated on the left side, why don't we just use the symmetric property of equality to write what was on the right hand side, now on the left, and what was on the left hand side, now on the right. So let's just chip away at everything until we have a cosine of A on the left. So we'll add one to both sides, and we'll divide everything by two. All right, and once again, let's replace A with a over two on both sides. So that's gonna give us cosine squared of a over two is equal to one half, one plus cosine of two times a over two, which of course, just like last time, that becomes simply a. And taking square roots to finally finish isolating cosine, we get this form which you can see is very similar to the half angle identity for sine. The only difference is the operation in the middle. Okay, let's quickly uncover a half angle identity for tangent, and then we'll go on and do some examples. So tangent squared of a half angle, we know that's just sine squared of the half angle divided by cosine squared of a half angle. And we can see from this particular line that sine squared of a over two is one half of one minus cosine of a. And this particular line tells us that cosine squared of a over two is one half of one plus cosine of a. Of course, these one halves cancel. And taking square roots of both sides, we get the half angle identity for tangent. 
plus or minus the square root of one minus cosine of a over one plus cosine of a. All right, let's just summarize these things. All right, very good. So let's see some examples where we're going to need to use these identities. All right, we can use half angle identities to work out something like this, cosine of 67.5 degrees. Now, this is definitely not one of our familiar angles, like 30, 60, or 90, or 210 degrees, or anything like that. Nor is it an angle that we can add or subtract familiar angles to achieve, like 15 degrees, which we know is you know 45 degrees minus 30 degrees. And we use the sum and difference identities to handle that type of situation. So if you have like something like 67.5, then think about whether double that angle is something familiar. And in fact, 67.5 is half of 135. So that's the thread we want to pursue here. Let's say cosine of 67.5 degrees, which is what we're after. That's the same thing as cosine of 135 degrees over two. And now we can use the identity for cosine. So that would be giant square root of one plus cosine of simply 135 degrees, and this is all over two. All right, so we do need to choose whether or not this should be a plus or a minus. So how do we make that decision? Well, what is this equal to? This entire expression is cosine of 67.5, and 67.5 is in the first quadrant. Cosine of a first quadrant angle is positive. So this is going to be positive. OK, but now let's evaluate cosine of 135 degrees. And as 135 degrees is in the second quadrant, this is going to come out negative. And we know cosine of 135 degrees is negative rad 2 over 2. And of course, this is all over 2, and it's all within the square root. So the rest of this is simply cleaning up this expression. OK, well, let's multiply the numerator here and the denominator by 2. This is, of course, all occurring within the square root. So distributing the 2 in the numerator, we get 2 minus rad 2. And distributing the 2 in the denominator, of course, just give us a 4. Ah. But we can say this is the square root of 2 minus rad 2, all divided by the square root of 4. And the square root of 4 is 2. So there's our final answer. This is the exact value of cosine 67.5 degrees, which is pretty cool. All right. So for this one here, we are interested in cosine of x over 2. So I think it's a good idea to start with the cosine of x over 2 identity, right? The half angle identity for cosine. So this is going to be plus or minus 1 plus cosine of x all over 2. So we need to do two things here. We need to determine what cosine of x is which we could easily figure out with a triangle because we have cotangent of x and we know what quadrant x is in. This is just a coded way of saying that x is in the second quadrant. Uh, but we also need to determine whether or not this is positive or negative. And this depends on the quadrant of x over 2, right? Cosine of x over 2 is either positive or negative. So we will need to determine the quadrant of x over 2. Uh, we'll do that in a minute, though. So let's just first find cosine of x.
Okay, well we know cotangent of x is negative 3. Now cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent. Tangents opposite over adjacent, so cotangent would be adjacent over opposite, which means this would be a 3 and this would be a 1. And again, on a triangle, all the sides are positive. So using the Pythagorean theorem, we can figure out what little c is here. So we can see that c is the square root of 10. And now we can read sine, cosine, tangent, whatever, off of this triangle. We also know that since x is between pi over 2 and pi, x is in quadrant 2. And remember, we want cosine of x. So cosine of x, we can read as negative, because it's in the second quadrant, 3 over rad 10. Now let's rationalize this. So we're going to get negative 3 rad 10 over 10. Okay, well, let's quickly determine what quadrant x over 2 is in. Uh, how do we do that? Well, we were given this. So let's just manufacture x over 2 in the middle. And we'll do that by dividing everything by 2. So that's going to give us pi over 4 is less than x over 2 is less than pi over 2. And we can see from here that x over 2 is in the quadrant 1. Okay, very good. That means that cosine of x over 2 will be positive. In fact, any trig function of x over 2 will be positive. So now we can finish evaluating cosine of x over 2. So we're going to choose the plus because x over 2 is in the first quadrant. And we had a 1 plus cosine of x all over 2 inside this from the half angle identity. So that would be 1. And then cosine of x, we calculated to be negative 3 rad 10 over 10. So we just have to clean up this mess here and we'll be done. So we will do that by multiplying the numerator and the denominator simultaneously by 10. This is occurring within the square root. So distributing the 10 in the numerator we get 10 and then minus 3 rad 10 and this is all over 2 times 10 which is 20. And again this entire expression is taking place within the square root here. So now we just need to rationalize this. Okay. Well, the square root of 20 itself as a fraction reduces to 2 rad 5. So if we're going to rationalize this, all we have to do is multiply the top and the bottom by rad 5. So multiplying the top by rad 5 means that this term and this term will be multiplied by 5 within the square root. So we'll have 50 minus 15 rad 10, all divided by 2 times rad 5 times rad 5 is 2 times 5, which is 10. And that is our final answer. It looks very tempting to cancel things. It looks like things want to cancel, but nothing actually does here. This is as simple as this one gets. All right, so here we have an identity that needs to be verified. So, of course, as always, a good principle is to start with the more complicated side. However, an equally important policy is to start with the side that has a very clear directive. And in this case, I would say, starting with the left-hand side, we can right away use a half-angle identity, which is gonna unwrap this thing into some radical expression and we'll try to work with that at that point. So yeah, let's go with the left hand side here. So of course the first thing to do would be to write down the left hand side. And again at no point are we ever going to equate this with the right hand side. We're just going to hope we arrive to the right hand side. So what can we do with this? Well, not a lot. Let's use the half angle identity for our tangent. Uh, we know it's going to look like this. Okay, and how are we supposed to make this thing 
look like cosecant minus cotangent? Uh, well, that's not at all obvious. But what we can do is a little trick we've done a couple of times now, and that is multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate of the bottom. Of course, again, this is all occurring within the square root. So if we FOIL the numerator, we're going to get 1 squared minus 2 times cosine of theta plus cosine squared theta. And if we FOIL the denominator, we're going to get 1 minus cosine squared theta. All right. Hmm. Still not quite clear what's happening here. But what we can do is we can say that the denominator is sine squared theta. Because we know that 1 minus cosine squared theta is sine squared theta. OK. So we can now split this into three distinct terms. We have 1 over sine squared theta minus 2 cosine of theta over sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta over sine squared theta. OK, 1 over sine squared, that's cosecant squared theta. Now what is 2 cosine theta over sine squared? Well, that is 2 cosecant theta cotangent theta. Uh, to convince yourself of that, let's just look at this thing out here for a moment. This is like 2 cosine of theta over sine theta times 1 over sine theta. And the cosine over sine is cotangent of theta. And the 1 over sine is cosecant of theta. So that's how we would convince ourselves that this expression in the middle is equal to 2 times cosecant cotangent. And finally, we have cosine over sine, which is cotangent. Of course, that's being squared. OK. Well, this big old expression here is a perfect square trinomial. So it factors into the expression cosecant of theta minus cotangent of theta, all squared. Right? So we're using the fact that a squared minus 2ab plus b squared is equal to a minus b quantity squared. Ah, OK. Well, we're taking the square root of a square. So perfect. This is cosecant minus cotangent. And hey, that's the right-hand side. So we win.